I was born and raised in North Dakota. Back when I was in high school, a group of us would research murders that occurred out in the county. We would then go out to find the scenes and film the exploration at night. This was about two years before the Blair Witch Project came out. It was something to do while we got wasted on beer and other teenage crap. Eventually we ran out of places to go and got really good at finding abandoned rural farmsteads by driving down dirt roads and looking for the signs. Rut roads, deliberate tree groves, and old mailbox posts were common markers. We were out looking when we spotted a tree grove that was out of place and drove through the field and discovered an old house. It had padlocks on the outside doors that were knocked off pretty easily. We dispatched them and entered the kitchen. There were six of us, all with flashlights, and we lit up the kitchen dining room area fairly easily. The table was the initial thing you noticed, and it was strange because of how normal it looked. It was set for a meal, and not a bowl was out of place. The only thing was, we had been in dozens of these houses, and place settings were a first, especially unbroken ones. As we investigated the area, we found the fridge that had disgusting remnants of a full stock, and the cupboards were full of canned and dry foods. This was also a first. One guy found mail on the counter from early June 1978, and another found a very creepy TV guide in the living room with UFOs on the cover. All the family photos were hanging up. Mom, Dad, brother and sister in their 1970s glory. Furniture was dusty, but in good condition. Closets were full. Everything was totally normal, which was super abnormal. As we dug around the house, we all started to realize that this house had not been moved out of. It had been straight up abandoned. Imagine locking the door to your house and never coming back. That's the state this house was in. Complete, unplanned departure. We went upstairs and split into three pairs to check out the three rooms. Ours was the closest and obviously it was the younger boy's room. I can't describe what it looked like too well because almost right away from the hall we heard the most terrifying scream I've ever had the misfortune of hearing. We went running into the hallway and were all yelling questions at each other at the same time. After a few really long seconds, the two screamers caught their breath and said, You have to go in and see. Walking down the hall and through the doorway, I prayed that I wouldn't act like a wuss in front of my friends. I shouldn't have been concerned because the others were just as scared as me. The room itself opened up to the left of the door frame, and centered on the right side of the room was a queen-size bed. Propped up on the pillows, with the blanket drawn to the waist, arms on top of the blanket, and worst of all, head turned slightly so it was looking you straight in the eyes when you entered the room, was a life-sized porcelain doll. Snow white skin, jet black hair, cold, dead eyes. The dead eyes lit up with our flashlights, like she was waiting for us. If the head hadn't been turned, I could excuse it, but it was turned, facing me, ready for when we walked in, ready for twenty years. Hasty exits were made down the stairs and into the car. It was during the ride we started to get even more creeped out when we realized that even though the house had been abandoned, someone had taken the time to set up that damn doll. Not packing food, clothes, or family photos, setting up the doll was one of the last things done in this house. We researched their names, but got nothing. No tragic car accident. No grisly massacre. No extended family. Just a tacky time capsule in the middle of nowhere. We found out that the county had taken possession of the land for non-payment of taxes. 
explaining the locks, but never tracked down any more information on what happened to them, or why they left that doll. Last year, a guy came to my front door at around 9 o'clock at night. He knocked, and I got my mom, and she went out to see what was up. By the way, we live in a very rural area, so visits that late are extremely uncommon and strange. The guy talked to my mom about how he was opening a business, asked whether she liked American-made products, then handed her a Clorox container as a sample he went back to his minivan and opened it to get a vacuum cleaner when my mom saw five other men sitting inside. She told me to run and get my phone since we don't have a landline. I couldn't find it, so I got my knife and stood around the corner. She threw the container outside and told them to get the hell off of her property or that she would call the cops. They peeled out of the driveway and we never saw the car again. Two months later, my mom found a single, bearded man putting filled garbage bags by the back door. She asked him what the hell he was doing, and he responded with, This is for your little girl. Talking about my little sister. Again, she told him to leave, and once he did, she went through the garbage bags. They were filled with dirty clothes and empty tampon containers. When I was a little, my mom would take me to Kmart and let me wander around the toy section while she shopped, which was normal in the 70s. One day, as I was playing Simon Says, an old man walked up to me and was making small talk while I played. He eventually told me to come with him and took me by my hand. We walked right down the main center aisle of the store, right towards the exit sign in the back. As we crossed the last row, I looked to the right and saw my mom at the end of the row. I told him I saw my mom and I had to go. I pulled my hand away and ran to her. I didn't tell her what happened because I didn't want to get in trouble for going with a stranger. It was several years later that I realized that I probably narrowly avoided being molested, kidnapped, or worse. When I was a kid, I was always the last kid picked up by the bus driver to go to school. One day, I was waiting for the bus by myself, and a bus with no kids pulled up. The bus driver smiled and told me to hop on. I just had a bad feeling. I said, where are the other kids? He said back, we will go get them now, just get on the bus. He got more and more pushy but didn't do anything crazy. I just kept saying no, and he shrugged and left. The real bus pulled up a few minutes later. I went to school, and my parents didn't know until I mentioned it that night. Looking back, they were pretty worried. I remember them scrambling around, making phone calls. I went camping with some friends on a hill a few kilometers out in the woods. There's a few hiking trails in the area that lead up to the hill, so it's known by the locals. It was about midnight, and we had a fire going. We were just sitting around having a good time. Then the guy sitting opposite of me yells, Who are you? At first I think he's talking to me, but then I turn around, and there's this man about six feet tall, staring at us from the edge of the woods with a big rock in his hand. The guy across from me grabbed the hatchet, and I pulled the knife off my belt. We had no clue what we were doing, but the guy wouldn't say anything to us. He just stood there. Eventually, 
he just backed into the woods and disappeared. No sleep was had that night, and we kept a very large fire going. I was six or seven years old in my parents' apartment and heading towards the kitchen where my mom is talking on the phone, cooking with the oven with the fan on, and at the end of the corridor in front of me, I see the front door opening and then halting because of the door chain holding it. I thought it was my dad. It was about 11 in the morning, so I think my dad will close the door and ring the doorbell for my mom to open up the chain. It was weird, because I hadn't heard the key turning and an enormous hairy hand that definitely didn't belong to my father tries to pull out the chain. Immediately I understand that it's an intruder and I rush to slam shut the door with my entire body and I would have managed it if the intruder didn't think to put his foot as an extra stopper. So there's me slamming against this door with all of my seven-year-old strength panicked out of my mind and then putting all my weight against the infernal piece of wood, with a huge intruder on the other side trying to keep the door open so he can pull the chain off, fingers trying to grasp the end of the chain, and my mother completely oblivious, about 12 feet away in the next room. I tried to scream at my mother. I remember yelling muffled pieces of, Mom! Mom! But she thinks I'm horsing around, and pays no attention. It's after my seventh or eighth scream when I was about to give up hope when I heard my mom tell the person on the other end of the line that she would call her back because I've done something and she needed to check on me. The intruder heard her and let me close the door. My mom arrived and demanded to know what I was doing. I'm crying at this point, not being able to utter a coherent sentence, trying to point at the door, saying only, Intruder outside or something to that effect. My mother, not getting the hint, comes over and tries to open the door to see what the fuss is about, with me still pushing against it with my back. As soon as I realized what she was about to do, I tried to push her away, crying, sobbing at her. Don't open the door. There's someone outside. I fell to my knees and begged her against trying to push me aside before she changed her mind and looked through the peephole instead. She looks through, and in a hurry starts saying, See? There's nobody there. And I see her very annoyed face turn pale as a sheet. She grabs me and pushes me away from the door, and tells me to go get her the phone. I rush to the kitchen and heard her yell through the door, I can see you crouching. I'm not going to open the door, and I'm calling the police right now. The bastard was still behind the door, crouching as low as he could, not making a sound, so that my mom would think nobody was there, and she would open the door and he would rush inside. My mom called the police and after five minutes of my mom issuing threats through the door, we heard somebody creeping away from our front door, down to the building entrance, and outside. My mom didn't express any emotion throughout the whole ordeal. It was as if she was scared stiff. About half an hour later, my father arrived, oblivious to the whole thing. When my mom told him what happened, he went and bought a new lock for the door. The police arrived that afternoon, a full five hours later, even though the police station is a ten-minute drive from our house. I don't think the intruder was ever caught. I usually get home between 2 and 3 a.m., but tonight I got off at around 11 because the bar had a power outage. I live alone in a triplex behind a house. I live in the middle of a city, but the property I'm on is rather large, so there is a big backyard behind my apartment. As I was coming home this night, I noticed that my cats weren't waiting for me in the window. They can hear my van pulling in the driveway. They are in the window every night, without fail. 
I thought it was really weird. Then I noticed that my kitchen light was on. I never leave my kitchen light on, or any light for that matter. At this point I was scared. That's when I thought I saw movement in my kitchen. I called 911 and the dispatcher told me to lock the doors to my van and remain in the vehicle and stay on the line. Officers showed up very quickly. They parked on the street and walked up to my van. They asked me to stay quiet and give them my house key. One officer went to the back of my apartment and the other used my key to unlock the door. When he opened the door, all was quiet. Then he yelled really loud telling someone to come out. I heard the police officer that was in my backyard start yelling and the other officer ran out to join him. My neighbors had come outside at this point and I was freaking out. It seemed like a long time, but they handcuffed and walked a woman towards me and it turns out it was a patron that I had 86th this last weekend. I don't know how she found out where I lived. She was hiding in my bedroom closet with a very large knife and a bundle of rope. I don't want to think about what would have happened if I had gone to bed with her hiding in my closet. I had been on a date with this guy. It was March of 2012. My date was asleep and his seat was reclined really low. We got into town at around 1 a.m. and I noticed this guy standing on the corner I was about to stop at, at a red light. He looked like he was probably on something. He was talking to himself and pacing. I was a little nervous, but not scared. I'm a little too quick to judge people sometimes. So I stopped and we accidentally made eye contact. At least I accidentally did. He was yelling bitch and some other words at me. It seemed to be the longest red light in history as the guy that was with me was sleeping cozily in the passenger seat. After about 10 seconds of the guy cussing me out, he ran up to my car and swings the passenger door open reaching for me. I started screaming bloody murder and the guy I was with woke up and started smacking the guy in the face. The crazy guy is yelling, I didn't see you, I didn't see you, and my date pushed him out the door and I drove off, running the red light. He closed the door and yelled, who the hell, what the hell, what is going on? I'm hyperventilating and start half laughing, half crying because my nerves were shot. We got some ice cream at 1am and then I took him home and went home myself. We laughed about it, but I don't like to think what would have happened to me if he hadn't been there. My mom had been calling a lot. It was my first semester away at college, and her husband had gone batshit insane. He hit her for the first time four nights before I moved out. She locked him out of the house and he banged on the doors. In the middle of the night, he had driven away and I hadn't seen him since. When I answered, she said she had gotten a phone call while she was watching TV. The person on the other end of the line said that he had been hired to kill her and her kids. But if she could make him a better offer, he wouldn't do it. He told her what TV show she was watching at that moment. He told her what dorm I lived in. He told her that my little brother was upstairs playing video games when he was supposed to be asleep. She ran upstairs. My little brother was playing video games in his room. She yelled at him to pack a bag. The person on the phone hung up and then she called me. I waited for 45 minutes before leaving, hoping my roommates would show up and help me figure out what to do. I had said call the police, but my mom said no. She asked me to come help her. 
My roommates didn't come home. The RA was gone. I got in my truck and made a 45 minute drive in 20 minutes. The highway was nearly deserted. I had hoped a police officer would pull me over, that they would know what to do and I would be able to say I hadn't called the cops. I accidentally missed my turn when my mom called me three times in a row. I accidentally ran a red light when I answered. A cop was right there. He didn't pull me over. When I got to our neighborhood, I parked two streets away and used my ROTC tactical movements to go through alleys to our backyard. I tried to call my mother three times, but she didn't answer. I put my phone on vibrate. The gate was closed, but when I opened it, I saw the back door standing open. Light from the kitchen partially illuminating the patio. No one was out there. I hesitated and went in, calling out softly for our dogs. They weren't there. Those dogs bark at everything. They were either not in the house, or they were dead. I got a knife and started a room by room search. Kitchen and laundry room were clear. The dining room, clear. Living room, clear. But oh shit, there's a broken vase. Downstairs bathroom, clear. I didn't go into the master bedroom because I fully expected to find my mother dead. I needed to get upstairs to the second bedroom on the right, my bedroom, to get my rifle, the only gun in the house. But no one was downstairs and upstairs was completely dark. There was a blind corner right at the top of the stairs. Anyone could be hiding there. I was 100% freaking out as I climbed the stairs. I got almost halfway up when someone started banging on the front door, which is right in front of the stairs. I froze. I turned halfway so that no one could surprise me from the second floor. Who's there? I screamed. My cover was blown anyway. If anyone was in the house, they knew I was there now. Whoever was outside could see me through the glass at the top of the door, but it was too dark for me to see them. No one answered, but they kept pounding on the door. Who the hell is it? I screamed, now at the base of the steps. They kept banging on the door. I'll kill you, I screamed as I flung open the door to see my mother standing there with the dogs in her arms. Why didn't you answer? I asked. She said she wasn't sure if it was me or not. And if it hadn't been me, what were you going to do? Throw the dogs at them? She hadn't thought that far ahead. I told her the back door had been open, but she said it was locked when she left. I said that I had checked most of the downstairs and was going upstairs for the gun. She said go up and get it, so I went up with my knife and checked upstairs while I was at it. Then I checked the rest of the downstairs. I spent the night barricading the doors and windows and begging her to leave. Just leave. She baked me some cookies. Her face was blue and purple from her husband's last visit. She said my brother had tried to protect her, and he didn't look so good either. I said that I would kill him. She said she knew, and so did he, which is why he always left when they called me. I feel I should mention that he was a good foot taller than me and easily 50 pounds heavier, but I would have killed him. In the morning, I had to leave early to be at PT for ROTC at 5.30 a.m. I had maybe 45 minutes of sleep where my mom had asked me to stay on the living room floor outside the master bedroom. I lost it at PT and then again in my weekly meeting with my athletics advisor. My ROTC instructors and my athletics advisor were horrified. We got a restraining order that day against my mom's husband. A few weeks later, my mom's husband tried to kill her on my 19th birthday. He was in his car and he had thrown her phone, which she was used to dialing 911 on, the passenger seat. She reached in to get it and he grabbed her arm and held on while he reversed out of the driveway and dragged her down the alley. 
He let go and her head slammed to the ground. She had a concussion. He tried to back over her, but she screamed and rolled away. He ran over her foot and hand. Our neighbor came out of her house and screamed, which scared him away. My mom and brother went into hiding that night. Being on those stairs, certain that my family was dead and I was about to confront the killer, was the scariest moment of my life and having someone bang on the door and not answer when I'm screaming at them. Having to open it while thinking a killer was on the other side. Creepiest moment of my life. About three years ago, I moved to London I was looking for a flatmate, but had no luck. I turned to my friend Marcus. After a week or two, Marcus and I moved in together. After we moved in, he put some of his stuff in storage so that he could make room for me in his flat. When I moved in, everything was fine and well. Fast forward about a year. I went to get some stuff out of the storage locker that Marcus put his stuff in. As I opened the door, An absolutely rank scent hit me like a ton of bricks. I switched the light on and saw a couple of old boxes and a couch. I was looking for the source of the smell, but I couldn't find it. I grabbed what I came for and left before I could vomit. Now, fast forward about a month. I went back to the storage unit to get something else, and the smell was even worse than before. I had to hold my nose as I walked into the storage unit. I saw an open box, and I decided to look in it. I found stuffed animals, like dead animals that were stuffed. I looked into the box under that one, and I found more rotting animals. I was completely disgusted and shocked, so I immediately went to Marcus to confront him. As I walked into the flat, I shouted, Marcus! Why are there dead animals in our storage locker? He came out of his room and sat me down on the couch. He told me that he wanted to be completely honest with me and told me that he was into necrophilia. Let's just say that I am now moved in with my parents. During some cave exploring, my family and some friends were in some deep caves, and as we were heading out, we found a slit about knee-high in the rock. Getting on your stomach, there was a tight squeeze you could get into and lead into a small crawl space in the rock, with quartz growing on the ceiling, making a beautiful crystal ceiling display. We went in one by one, and if you were claustrophobic, This place was your living nightmare. Most times you could feel the ceiling on your back and the floor on your stomach every time you took a breath. We went deep in and it was just incredible, like a small world tucked away within solid rock. I had made it as deep in as I could go before the path waned to the left and covered with sediment. Everyone was having a grand time when we started feeling some trickles of water on our backs. It turns out, it had started raining outside, and with the way the crawl space dipped down before flattening out, the whole place would fill up with rainwater very fast, with only one way for it to drain out, which was the way that we came in. It started as trickles before it went into streams and began to pool up, Being the furthest away from the exit, and you can only just crawl flat on your stomach with jagged crystal pointing down from the ceiling, I started to panic. Everyone crawled out as fast as they could as the water kept rushing in, the streams growing larger and larger. We exited one at a time as fast as we could, but it wasn't fast enough. I could feel the water coming up to my chin as I crawled behind my brother. Every inch I moved forward felt so painfully slow 
that I could feel the walls compress around me, and the water was unrelenting, now splashing against my panic squirms. I got out just as the water was up to my lips. Everyone got out safely, but it was the scariest moment of my life. Maybe a couple more minutes trapped in there, and I would have been dead. It was a normal night. I got home from work, ate dinner, and watched some TV. I went to sleep at around midnight, and nothing out of the ordinary happened. When I woke up, again, everything seemed normal, until I got out of bed and looked into the mirror hanging on my bedroom door. I was more shocked and confused than scared at first. There was a huge smiley face drawn onto the mirror with black marker, and a key taped to the mirror right underneath it. The key was to my front door. This was a one-time thing. Nothing else ever happened. Of course I got my locks changed that day, but to this day I have trouble sleeping. Understandably, right? Someone was in my house inside my bedroom while I slept. I have no idea who or why. When I was a kid, I was staying in this really old cottage with my family. I woke up and went to the bathroom around 3 a.m. While I'm sitting on the toilet in this tiny bathroom, I suddenly hear someone whisper my name. I kind of shake it off, since I figure I'm still sleepy, and maybe I didn't hear it right. Maybe it was the trees from the open window. I go about my business for about another ten seconds before I hear my name again, much louder. There was no mistaking it this time, and there's no doubt it was coming from right outside the window. I finished up as fast as I could, all while my name is still being whispered. The sink was directly across from the toilet, and above it there was a mirror. I washed my hands while looking at my feet, because I had this terrible feeling that if I looked up, I would see whatever was chanting my name outside the window. I ran back to my bed, and I don't think I went to the bathroom in the middle of the night for at least six years after that happened. I still can't explain who it was outside the window. The cottage was small, and I could see everyone in my family asleep in their beds on my way to the bathroom. On top of that, the cottage was in the woods, so even if it was a random creeper, I don't know how they would have known my name, or that I would happen to go to the bathroom at 3 a.m. It creeps me out when I think about it to this day. We have had weird experiences in that cottage, but that was by far the worst. I had very strange dreams when I was a kid. I dreamed that I was at a large amusement park type place. It had rides and some obstacle courses, like a rock wall and a ball pit. About six months later I dreamt about the same place, and then again six months later. It was always dark outside, but there were many lights. They kept moving stuff around. Every time things would be different, but it was still the same place. The place was showing signs of age. It looked like it might have been 15 to 20 years old. Things were beginning to rust. I had to convince myself that if this place existed, that I had never been there while I was awake. The place always had a very sinister feel to it, as if there was something going on that couldn't be seen. It was as if I were to stray off the path, I could easily become lost or trapped and that if I were there, I was already off the path. 
There were never any ride attendants, nobody selling t-shirts, just people seemingly walking around with blank faces. After a while, I forgot about it. A year later, I was laying in my bed at my father's house. Suddenly, I was there again. I couldn't believe it. This time, it was a totally abandoned amusement park, beyond repair and completely deserted. Grasses growing through the sidewalks and the buildings being overrun with vegetation, everything rusty and broken. It was still dark outside and the place was lit up with artificial light, no longer bright, old style yellow light bulbs. All the colorful lights were gone. Although the creepy factor had increased, I was never afraid. If there were anything to fear about that place, it was gone now. It was a very interesting dream. I always felt very uneasy when I woke up. Somehow it was the same place every time, but it would change, just getting darker and darker. A few years ago I was leaving my boyfriend's house late at night. I had to stop to get gas before the drive home, so I pulled into the first open gas station that I saw. I started walking into the store when out of nowhere a man ran up to me and yelled, get back in your car and leave. Something in his panicked expression told me that he wasn't messing around and I got out of there as fast as I could. The next day we found out that the gas station was robbed and the attendant was killed. I had to call the police department to tell them about the guy and to this day I don't know if he was a good Samaritan or the killer. I had a co-worker I got along great with. We were good friends in the first two months of meeting each other. He was always punctual, so when he failed to show up for work and answer his texts, I had a feeling that something was wrong. That day, I happened to work until 11 p.m. I had to stay late to finish his work before I could get off. I have lived in Michigan and grew up in the country, so when I'm walking at night, I keep my hood on, no music, and I walk home as fast as I can. It was a quiet night, so dark, that I only saw the smallest twinkle of stars in the sky. I got a creepy feeling that I was being followed, but I didn't see anyone. I resolved to stay alert as I hit the halfway mark to my house. On the way home at night, the last stretch has no street lights. Once I passed the last street light, I heard it. Click, 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 click. It sounded like a bike. When I turned my head, I saw it. It looked like a girl around my height with a black dog beside her. She had a white shirt with a skirt on. The way she was walking was disturbing, almost like a clown. I didn't know how she was making the noise, but I sped up. I casually looked back again, and from the distance I was at, it appeared as though the girl didn't have a face. Click, 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 click. I didn't run, but instead picked up my walking pace more. I was almost home. I didn't look back again, and by the time I reached my apartment, the clicking sound had stopped. I found out the next day that my co-worker had passed away the day that he didn't come in. I have taken the same route home several times in the year since my co-worker died, but not once have I heard the sound, or have I seen the faceless girl in white, or her dog. Click, click.
I grew up in a haunted house, but I'm not sure if it was me or the house that was haunted. I've had spooky shit happen to me my whole life. This is one of interest. I'm not here to prove that the supernatural exists. If you don't believe it, that's fine by me. But I know what I experienced. When I was a young child, I had an imaginary friend called Sally. She wore a white dress, black shoes, and a red bow in her hair. She was white and had blonde hair in a ponytail that went down to her waist. We would only play in my basement, never outside, in a park, or upstairs in my home. As I got older, I forgot about her, and I figured that she was just a fragment of childhood imagination, and didn't think about her until I was a teenager. My best friend and I were talking about our childhoods, and eventually spoke of imaginary friends. I brought up Sally, and to my surprise, my bestie described her to a T. I asked her how she knew, and she said, Sally is in the corner. She's always in the same room as you. She doesn't like that I can see her, and is glaring at me. That gave me chills. Whenever my bestie was over from then on, I would ask her where Sally was. She would point to a corner, and I shit you not, I would see a white flash in the spot she had been pointing. My ex-boyfriend told me that he would see a split image of a little girl glaring at him from corners if he entered a dark room alone. I was talking to my current boyfriend a couple of months ago about Sally, because he believes in the paranormal. When I described what she looked like, he got pale and told me that he too had seen her. According to him, he saw her in a closet one day. He opened the closet and right in front of his face was a pale blonde girl with a white dress and a red bow. Her eyes were pitch black pits and her mouth was agape with pointed teeth. Ice went down my spine after he told me that. I told him that my favourite place to hide as a child was that closet. I played a lot of hide and seek in that house, and no one ever found me in that spot. My boyfriend's childhood home is also haunted. If you look in the kitchen window at night, you can sometimes see a face looking at you in the second story window. His parents have both said they'd seen it. I've seen it too, and it scared the crap out of me. My boyfriend's house was haunted like I said. Here's an incident that happened at the time. He and I are weirdos, and fairly quickly into our relationship, we started discussing the paranormal. He said that, as a child, he would see figures running in the patch of trees behind his house. He told me about the face in the window and phantom footsteps that would walk around his house when he was home alone. I didn't doubt a word. One night after work, he picked me up to spend the night at his house. I worked really late, so it was around 1am-ish, and we hung out in his garage so that we wouldn't wake his parents up. After we went to bed, I realised that I had left my purse in the garage and stepped out to get it. At this point, I had seen the face in the window, so I was wary of his house at night. His garage is detached from the house, so I had to go outside. I have to fully step inside the garage to reach the light switch, and to my dismay, the lights had barely turned on and only gave off half a flickering glow as they were old crappy tube lights. My heart was pounding as I walked into the depths of the half-lit garage. As soon as I grabbed my bag, the lights turned off, and I heard the sounds of children laughter surrounding me. I booked it back inside 
and didn't even bother hitting the light switch. I told my boyfriend, and we both didn't get much sleep that night, and I have never been to that garage alone since. This other incident happened to me. When I was a kid, I had friends in the neighbourhood that I hung out with all the time. There was an old lady down the street that we called Granny Shay, and I would go visit Shay to swing on her tyre swing sometimes and play with her cats, crows and kittens. She always fed the strays and birds so they were friendly. Granny Shay loved me, but hated the other kids, as they were mean to her cats and ruined her garden. Granny Shay passed away when I was in high school, and her granddaughter rented a room in the house to one of my childhood friends. One of the boys that Shay had disliked so strongly. One night, the granddaughter was away and my friend had a small party at Shay's house. We were sitting in his room when he told us that Shay had died on the very bed that we were sitting on. Being teens, some of the guests started yelling at Shay, demanding that the spirit show herself, taunting her and saying she was dumb for dying and stupid and stuff like that. I got uncomfortable and stood up to leave. Before I got to the door, the lights in the room shut off and I was next to the switch and went to flip it when I felt that it was already in the on position. I turned the switch down and the lights came back on. They immediately turned off and I turned them on again. Then the lights rapidly started switching on and off, even though at this point I was no longer touching the switch. Some of the people in the room started yelling at me for messing with them, and the lights turned back on with a feeling of finality. On the wall above the bed was a black handprint that had not been there before. We yelled and ran out of that room, and I ran back home and never set foot in that house again. I am a 25 year old female. I was 23 at the time this took place. I had been a college student, but had to quit due to a major surgery in my leg. So I was unemployed and had just spent a few months recovering. I was finally off crutches, but still limping around and lived in an old Victorian two-storey house that is now a duplex. I live on the ground floor and a middle-aged reclusive woman occupies the whole second floor. There are separate outside entrances, you see. And I live with a male housemate that was also a friend that is a few years older than me and was employed as a security guard at a local casino. Our street is known for being seedy and not a good neighbourhood. But I've always felt pretty safe, never had too much trouble. One night, as I was home with my roommate and my boyfriend, we were all watching movies in the living room, which is out in the front of the house. My roommate's girlfriend then comes over drunk with another male friend of ours. The male friend sat down to watch movies with us and immediately passed out. And my roommate and his girlfriend went to his bedroom at the back of the house and immediately started having the most insanely loud intercourse I've ever heard. She always sounded like a trashy porn star. But anyway, a few minutes into the session, my boyfriend and I were still watching the movie and we hear a loud scream coming from the back of the house. We couldn't distinguish what it was, maybe something getting knocked over, but we figured it was just my roommate and his girlfriend being extremely loud and all over the place. 
Eventually, they finished and the house was finally quiet. Our movie ended and we decided to go to bed in my room. My room is in the middle of the house and shares a wall with my roommate's wall and the living room on the other side. My bed was against the outside wall of my room parallel to an old window that slides up and down. The side and back of our house are pretty high off the ground. Looking out the window, it's a decent drop to the ground. Outside my window are vertical and horizontal beams that extend to hold up a little porch balcony for the lady upstairs. It really ruins the view having beams right there. My boyfriend went into my room and took off all of his clothes and jumped into bed. I started to take off my clothes too, but stopped. When I noticed the screens of my windows missing and it being open, I had a cat that at the time was indoor only. So my first thought was, the screen is missing. Striga must have gotten out of the window. Then I noticed that the window was pushed up way more than I thought possible. And I kept thinking of my cat though. I was obsessed with keeping her inside. My first thought was to look under the bed and to see if she was maybe under there. It was dark, but I saw a black mass and reached out to grab her. And thankfully she was still inside. The black mass wasn't her. It was a black hoodie. And someone was in it. I had grabbed someone's arm. For some reason, my first thought at that moment was that a friend was playing a prank on me, and it was probably someone I knew. So I kind of laughed it off and said, Hey, there's someone under here. Then I lowered my face to meet his face. And I realized I'd never seen this guy before in my life. This was not a friend and not a joke. I don't know this guy, I said in a less slightly calm voice, and my boyfriend was completely naked, and told me to grab my gun, as I was nearer to the closet than he was. Stay where you are, he screamed at the mass under the bed. The guy cooperated. I threw my boyfriend a robe, and he put it on, and jumped out of the bed near the closet where I was. He took the gun and pointed it at the bed and told the guy to come out slowly with his hands out. Since my roommate is a security guard, I ran to wake him up for backup. He rushed into the room, and the three of us stood there with a teenage boy wearing a black hoodie coming out from under the bed. We were all kind of in shock, and we started to question the kid, who cooperated with us completely. He was being quiet and humble. His eyes shook violently from side to side, as if he was high or something. My roommate searched him. We emptied his pockets, and he had condoms, lube, porn advertisements from the back of the dirty magazine, and some dirty pills that he told us were Vicodin, but they were really just extra strength ibuprofen. He also had a pair of my dirty underwear in his pocket. Dirty underwear? that I had just had my period all over. That was the most disgusting part. We found ID on him as well, and a business card from a youth probation officer, so clearly he was a troublemaker. We also found a piece of paper, with names and phone numbers on it, that indicated he lived with his mother in a hotel room in a notorious drug motel that catered to prostitutes and men. His high school ID was from Hooper High, and he was clearly from the local Hooper Native American tribe, or at least part Hooper Native. When we saw he had no weapons, we started questioning why he was in my bedroom under the bed with all that stuff, and asked if he realised how serious this was. He quietly replied that he heard sex from the street and thought he could have some. Basically. He was a horny teenage boy on some sort of drug, riding his bike around at night, and my roommate's trashy girlfriend's sex noises 
were like a siren song in the night to this kid. He was so overcome by his horniness that he scaled the scaffolding and beams near my open window and crawled in under my bed, probably to masturbate, to what to he thought he was hearing in the next room. He probably jizzed on my underwear. He then kept apologising and saying he was sorry and God knows what. I was in shock and disgusted and wondered if he would have raped me if I'd have been alone. But we all felt a little compassion for the stupid kid. His fate was basically in our hands at that point and we debated whether or not to call the police. We finally decided not to and we basically lectured him and told him how lucky he was that he crawled into my window and not someone else's because we could have shot him or called the police and had him arrested and whatever he was on for probation for would have been a lot worse. He kept thanking us and was super humble at that point. My roommate then escorted him out the front door and took his bike that he had left on the lawn and walked him to his shitty motel and watched him go inside. We kept all of his stuff. He didn't have money, just trash IDs and phone numbers and made sure to tell him we had his IDs and we knew where he lived. We had his mum's number and his probation officer's number and that if we ever saw him on the street again, he'd regret it. A drunk friend and my other roommate's girlfriend slept through the entire ordeal and we told them next morning what had happened whilst they slept. Last year, in May, I was on a yoga retreat in Thailand, in Koh Phagan. It was a small but well-known yoga and detox centre that was located near the water. The main centre consisted of a totally open-air restaurant lounge which faced the water and a yoga shala. There were some bamboo huts further to the back of the restaurant. The yoga centre and restaurant were completely open to the main road, as there were no doors nor gates at the centre, meaning anyone could walk through it day or night. It appeared to me that the centre must have expanded at some point, because after checking in, as I was being led to my room, rather than going to one of the bamboo huts behind the restaurant, I was led past that across the main road, which was a small road by the way, where there was an open area surrounded by forests and trees. In this area, they had built a further strip of connected rooms, probably a block of six to seven rooms, and mine was the one at the very end. The path that continued past the end of my room had lots of trees, bushes, and natural vegetation. I recall being disappointed that my room was so far from the centre, as it really did feel like I was on a separate property, although in reality it was probably no more than a brisk five minute walk. An issue I had with the yoga centre was how dark it was at night. There were no lights on the path that led to my room, and I'd feel uncomfortable walking there at night as it felt very isolated and open. Also, even in the main centre's open-air restaurant area, it was very dimly lit, and the place would be totally deserted after 9pm. My first night, I thought I'd hang out in my hammock and listen to the waves crash. But as people left the restaurant area, I was the only one left in this dark open space, and I suddenly felt very vulnerable. The space was very open, with no security guards, and I recall feeling strangely unsafe. I am not one to generally be scared or feel unsafe, but I felt it then. I didn't make a big deal out of it, just got back to my hammock and trekked back to my room. However, I did avoid the restaurant area at dark once people had left. As it was a yoga and detox centre, 
Most people were in their rooms by nine. So, although I didn't go to bed that early, there was no open or communal area at the centre, other than the restaurant for me to hang out in. So I just went to my room. While I would have liked to hang out in the restaurant by the water, it just felt too deserted on an open night. On my third night there, I decided to have a cigarette at 10pm. The centre was non-smoking, although I did question whether I could smoke outside my room, since it was technically so far from the actual centre. But not wanting to break any rules, I walked about 40 feet from the path down my room to smoke. It was while I was smoking that I saw the man to my right. He was a small Thai man wearing a white shirt and he was looking at me. I decided to smile at him and he smiled back. Then he started walking towards me until he was standing next to me. I thought it was odd, but that may be he was just another friendly local. Although alarm bells were starting to ring that this was strange. I said hello in Thai and he did the same but beyond that he didn't speak English, and of course I didn't speak a word of Thai other than that. I had been staring at the beautiful full moon, so I pointed to the moon. After that, I didn't know what other interaction I could have with this man, and thought it best to get back to my room quickly. I turned to him and said bye and went to leave. When I did, he quickly grabbed my right forearm and placed a strong grip on it. I pulled my arm back, but he held tightly as his grip hardened. As I mentioned, this was a small man, and I'm a 5 foot 9 female who weighed roughly 165 pounds at the time. Although I have never gotten into a fight in my life, I felt that unless this man had a weapon or knew some kind of martial art, I could probably hold my own. As it dawned on me that this man was not letting go, and in fact he was gripping my arm in a way no one with any good intentions ever would, I knew I had to get out of there before the situation escalated into something I couldn't imagine. I firmly planted my feet on the ground, turned my body, yanked my arm, and started running back to my room. As I was running, I thought, if I run right to my room, he'll know where I'm staying. Thankfully, I saw that my neighbour Klaus from Germany still had his light on. I started calling Klaus, can you come outside? He opened the door and I entered his room. I stopped running, turned back, but the man was gone. I let Klaus know of what had happened, and he spent some time making sure that I was alright before I returned to my own room. I was a little shaken, but also thought that perhaps it was nothing. Maybe the guy was just trying to be nice and grab my arm to point out some stars or something. I don't know. In the aftermath, I downplayed the significance of it and thought that perhaps I had just made a mountain out of a molehill. Though, I did note not to smoke out there at night. Two days after this incident, I see Klaus in the morning, and he tells me that the man who frightened me also scared another woman last night. I was shocked and asked who, and he said it was Tammuz, a beautiful 24-year-old Israeli girl who had just arrived. I found her and asked her what had happened, explaining what had occurred to me. She told me that last night which was the night after my incident, she had been sitting in the open-air restaurant at around 10, messaging someone on her phone. The place was empty as usual, except for her. She's a teeny tiny woman who weighed probably no more than 90 pounds. She looked up at one point and saw this Thai man standing, kind of hidden in the restaurant, watching her very carefully. She immediately felt uncomfortable, but went back to her phone. As she did this, 
she could see him quietly moving closer to her. She said that right away she felt danger, and she knew that she was in an unsafe situation with this man creeping up on her. I asked her what she did, and Tamu said that she recalled her training from the Israeli army, and when she was about 10 feet from her, she stood up, making herself seem as big as possible, as she's a wisp of a woman, mind you, and she showed me how she stood straight, shoulders back, chest forward, and arms firmly to her sides, but away from her body. She had a thick glass mug with her at the time, and she held this firmly in her grip. She didn't raise the mug, but made it visible and clear that she would use this thick glass mug as a weapon if need be. She said that as she took this stance, she looked directly at him and shouted out, Stop! She said the man stood there, looking at her for a few seconds as she held her position. She was a tiny woman taking a strong offence rather than a defensive posture. He then turned and walked away. Tammuz quickly gathered her things and returned to her room. Like me, she never hung out in the restaurant after dark again, unless others were there. Tammuz and I shared descriptions and concluded that it was indeed the same man. Later that day, the manager of the centre came looking for me. He looked very worried, and she told me she had just found out what happened. She asked me to tell her my story, and asked why I hadn't informed the centre right away. I told her the truth, which was that although my gut told me this man was dangerous, my mind told me that it wasn't really anything to think about, and that perhaps I would just misinterpreted the situation. Also, I had told Klaus in the immediate aftermath, and felt comforted that I had a neighbour just one wall away. I did tell them, though, that I thought the path to my room needed lights, as it was completely dark at night, and the room being so far away. They ended up installing lights on the path that same day, but also called the police, and we had an undercover police officer, posing as a guest at the centre for a few days. But nothing happened after that. Well, at least not for the next seven days I was there. My grandparents' house has had poltergeist activity since the 1970s. It started when my mother and her two sisters, Louise and Teresa, were playing around in a cemetery. I know, what were they doing playing in a cemetery? And to be honest, you've got me on that one. My mother apparently forgot about the age-old don't walk on the actual graves you asshole rule while they were playing hide and seek and was running from Teresa. She stepped on a grave and the ground gave way and she fell into the grave. According to her the grave was from 1907 and bore the same name as hers. They scooped some of the dirt out, took it home, and got the Ouija board. Jimi Hendrix had just passed away, and her older sister decided that she wanted to contact him. They decided that the best way to increase the power of the board was to sprinkle the grave dirt around it, light some candles, and turn out the lights. Jimi Hendrix did not answer them, obviously, but a woman named Amy did, and she apparently thoroughly chastised them for being naughty girls. The planchette immediately after moved to goodbye. According to all three women, the room was silent until the wind picked up outside and blew around the outside of the house in such a way that it sounded like a shrieking woman and a moaning man at the same time. There was no wind in the room, 
yet the candle flames instantly went out, and the lamp on the bedside table switched itself off. All three girls ran out of the room and hid in their father's bedroom between the wall and the bed. After they calmed down and no longer felt threatened, they discussed what should be done next. They went back into Louise's bedroom, where they had been performing the seance, brushed the dirt into a linen handkerchief, retrieved the board, retrieved salt and matches from the cupboard in the kitchen, and went outside in the backyard. They said the Lord's Prayer while holding hands and sprinkled the board and grave dirt with salt, poured gasoline on it and burnt it. They went back inside, feeling like this was over, and tried not to think about it anymore. Nothing happened for a few weeks, until the youngest sister, Louise, began having terrible nightmares, to which she would wake up screaming several times a night. My mother was next, followed by her older sister, Teresa. My grandparents, both very quiet, and not the type to tell tales, described the upcoming months as nights with no sleep, rushing from one room to another, flicking lights on and off, falling into bed after the soothing one daughter, drifting into sleep, only to be awoken by another screaming girl. This went on for several months, and then stopped abruptly. Just as my grandparents were beginning to feel well rested, Louise began screaming for her mother and father in the night again. There are people in my room! According to Louise, she would wake up because she could hear people talking, and when she would open her eyes, the bedroom lights would be on and there would be a man and a woman standing in the corner of her bedroom, sipping cocktails and having discussions about the weather. My grandmother started sleeping in a bed with her now 16 year old daughter. For the first few days nothing happened. Then my aunt poked her awake in the middle of the night. Grandma opened her eyes and looked around the room seeing nothing and heard no noises. And when she began to ask Louise why she woke her, Louise grabbed a fistful of her nightgown and said, shh, and then the lamp on the bedside table turned itself off. My grandmother jumped out of bed, grabbed Louise by the arm and dragged her into my grandpa's bedroom. She woke him up, told him what happened, and they both slept in his bed for the next several weeks until Teresa, now 18, was going off to college and moved out, at which time they moved Louise into Teresa's old bedroom. There were more things that happened over the years, but it slowly tapered off into an every once in a while thing, once they moved Louise into another bedroom. Now, 47 years later, that bedroom is like a time capsule. My grandmother used to clean it weekly, but they never moved anything out of it except Louise's clothing. All the furnishings have stayed the same, and after years of refurbishing every other room in the house, that room still has pea green shag carpeting, an orange and gold owl wallpaper. Since grandma died 10 years ago, and no one has really bothered with the room except for the occasional clean, when there are one too many extra overnight guests, and someone has to sleep there. And no one ever makes it all night. We almost always wake up to find this person sleeping on the couch. At night, when no one's in the room, you can hear people talking. A lot of people. Like there's some kind of party going on in there coming from that room. As a child, that room was the source of nightmares. All the other cousins would play tricks on the younger ones to force them into that room only to lock them in. I myself was locked in the closet when I was seven, but that's a whole nother story. Until their cries for help attracted adult attention, or even just the standard, you're too little to play with us. You have to stay in the back bedroom for five minutes alone if you want to play. 
They've been small bouts of activity through the house over the years. But it's really just something that everyone got used to. And for the last 35 years or so, the room has kind of just belonged to them. My older cousin actually locked me in the closet in that room when I was about five. I say locked, but all she really did was close the door. I don't remember why I couldn't get out, but I remember trying to open the door and not being able to. I didn't want to yell for help, because that would make me a chicken, and she wouldn't want to play with me anymore, and it would get her in trouble, and she wouldn't want to play with me even more after that. So I sat on the floor of the closet with my back to the wall. It was quiet for a moment, and I heard footsteps outside the door, so I thought she was finally going to let me out. But she didn't. According to her and everyone else in the house, she had gone outside to ride her bike. I heard the wire coat hanger start moving back and forth across the rail on its own, scraping back and forth, and then an old doll fell from the top shelf and landed in front of me. It was the kind that had the little sandbox inside, and when it landed at me, I looked at its little sad plastic face, and it said, Mama. I started screaming bloody murder, and pounded on the door, and my grandfather came to the rescue. I remember hearing him running down the hallway, and seeing him sling the door open. It was really traumatic for me, probably not as traumatic for my cousin, and he made her sleep in that room all by herself that night as punishment. She's pretty much hated my guts ever since, but... It was all her fault anyway. This happened probably about 15 years ago, pre-cell phone days. My mom and I had gone to a movie at the movie theater by my house in the evening. It was so fun and I really enjoyed our time. My parents were really awesome and took us out for outings like this on occasion. Sometimes as a whole family. Sometimes just one on one. The movie theater we had gone to had one of those Dance Dance Revolution games. And at the time I was in love with those games. I begged my mom to let me play it. Just once before we went home. She said yes and stood to the side of the machine while I booted up the game. I was wearing terrible shoes to play. They were like dress shoes with a slight heel, and so I didn't do very well. So I only wanted to play one round and then leave. As I was playing, a man had walked to my mom and had started a conversation. I have no idea what it was about, but my mom is a very polite person. And so she made small talk as she waited for me to finish up. I finished and we went to make our exit and this is where it got weird. The movie theater itself did not have a very big lobby, but it had two sets of doors with parking lots on either side. The front door came out into a larger shopping complex, parking lot, and then the back door faced out into a small parking lot with overflow parking across the street. The doors to both sides were also flanked by very large, floor-to-ceiling windows that allowed pretty good eyesight into the parking lots. I thank God we had parked in the front parking lot, because at the time there was not much happening in the back, and way less people. The man had walked out with us to the parking lot, to go to his truck. As a child, my siblings and I were always taught to be weary of strangers, even the ones that seemed kind. For that reason, I was very on edge that this man continued to walk with us, and make conversation with the woman, and her young child. I kept thinking that I should say I had to go to the bathroom so we could go back inside the busy, well-lit theater. My mom must have been thinking the same thing and stopped very abruptly and said to the man that she had forgotten something inside the theater and very firmly and quickly led me back into the movies and into the woman's bathroom. We got inside the woman's bathroom. My mother very quickly explained to me that the man had been digging around in his pockets and kept saying that he couldn't remember where his truck was. My mom explained to me that she did not want the man to know what our car looked like. I suspect now that she was worried that he would overpower us and force his way into the car 
he was probably 300 pounds easy. I was a very anxious child, and having my gut feeling confirmed by my mom set me into hysterics. I was crying hysterically and begging my mom to please tell the theater and have us walked out to our car or have them let her use their phone to call my dad to come meet us. Kudos to my mom, who I know was very scared and said so, but told me to remain calm and we would wait inside the theater for a little bit so she could think about what to do. Holding my hands, she let a now terrified me into the lobby and looked out the window. The man was standing a ways away from the door. We stood back from the windows, so to this day I'm not sure if he could see us or not. I was frantic at this, and I was convinced that harm would come to both of us. My mom told me not to worry, and that we would stay in the theater as long as we needed to. Finally, after what seemed like a good 30 minutes, the man gave up and walked out into the parking lot. We remained inside the theater after he had walked away for a good 15 minutes. We left as other people were leaving and made our way to the car swiftly. Obviously, the man did not follow us or cause us any harm, but my mom was very frightened. When we got home, my dad was upset that this happened. She and I both are reserved people, so I'm sure the reason my mom didn't say much to the theater or call my dad is because she didn't want to make a scene or cause any trouble. I am thankful she has taught me street smarts, and they have saved me from a lot of situations as I got older and did not have her by my side. The best advice she would give me was that any decent person would not be offended by a young girl or woman being afraid of them or declining to help them, as they would understand why. I went on a school trip to Scotland my senior year in high school. I'm American. And our last night there, I had easily one of the most unsettling experiences of my life. There were probably about 15 students on the trip, and we had three teachers with us. We went all over Scotland, staying in different hostels and with locals that the teachers had gotten to know over the years that they'd been running this trip. So the last night we were staying in Edinburgh. The girls all stayed in one room, the boys in one, and the teachers in another. Since it was the last night, me and the rest of the girls all were planning on staying up late to finish the journals, the projects, and assignments that we would have to turn in the next day. It was really, really hot that day, about 80, which I understand to be unusual for that area, so the hostel didn't have air conditioning. Because it was so hot, all of us ended up sitting around in mostly our underwear, like sports bras and spandex, to avoid dying from the stagnant heat on the top floor of this hostel, with no air conditioning and windows that didn't open. At some point, my friend Ellie's boyfriend, Jack, texted her and said he was coming up to say goodnight. A couple minutes later, there was a knock on the door, so Ellie answered, thinking it was Jack but it was an Asian man that none of us recognized. When Ellie opened the door, I was sitting next to it with my backpack against the wall. So I was sitting feet away from the man in my underwear, in plain sight, and I looked up to find him staring at me. The weirdest part was he didn't say anything. He probably didn't speak English, but still. When Ellie said something like, Oh, hi, can we help you? He just stood there silently. At this point, Jack comes down the hall and sees the guy at our door. And when the man sees Jack, he just turns around and walks back down the hall. All of us were kind of like, that was weird. But we just assumed that he was lost and didn't speak English. So he mistook our room for his. Ellie steps out into the hall and closes the door to talk to Jack. But pretty soon we can hear Jack saying, Hey man, what are you doing? Or something like that and I open the door enough to report to everyone that the man is back, standing in the hallway with Ellie and Jack. Our room was at the very end of the hallway, and the door was a good 20 yards from any other doors to rooms. So there really was no reason for the man to be there. Ellie comes back inside and Jack talks to the guy for a minute, but everything he says is in extremely broken English, and Jack can't understand him at all. So we just lock our door and Jack goes to bed. It's probably 2 to 3 a.m. at this point, 
so it's even weirder that this man is just wandering around. We all put t-shirts and shorts on at this point, now that we're anxious about this strange guy. No more than 20 minutes later, there's a knock on the door, and Ellie opens it again because Jack had left his charger with her, and she thought he might come back for it. And it was the man again. This time, Ellie goes to shut the door immediately, when she sees it's him, but he grabs the door and says with a thick accent, let in. Ellie forcefully closes the door and I scooted a foot over to sit in front of it while she locked it with my back against it so he can't open the door before she gets it locked because there was no deadbolt. Everyone in the room is now just staring at each other silent and wide-eyed. Then the man starts banging on the door screaming, let in, let in. He's obviously pounding with his fist and I can feel him hit the door with his full body weight trying to get it open. Everyone in the room is frozen, and we expected it to just pass, but after about five minutes of the relentless yelling and banging, I said someone needs to call a teacher. So another girl tries to give a teacher a call, but we're in Scotland, so we don't have any service. We text the teachers hoping they'll wake up, and then send a text to the group message of students on the trip, telling them that there was a man trying to get into our room and that we needed to get a teacher up here as fast as we can to help. Apparently Jack had been uncomfortable with the man since he met him in the hall, and had been up thinking about it, so we saw the text pretty quickly and went to our teacher's room. The banging had been going on continuously for about 15 minutes by the time a teacher was on his way to our room. But all of a sudden the banging just stopped. 20 seconds later there's a polite knock on the door, and everyone in the room stays silent until our teacher says it's him. We open the door and can see the man walking back down the hallway, and I point him out to our teacher, but there's nothing he can really do since the man stopped and didn't speak English. Our teacher told us to text him if it happened again, and he would contact the hostel staff to get the man removed, but it never happened again. I still wonder why that man was doing it. There's a possibility that he was genuinely convinced that our room was his, but he would have had a key that he realized didn't work instead of just banging on the door. It all was just generally a very strange and unsettling experience. My crazy story began when my family and I moved to another church when I was about 16. The youth president from said church started to be really friendly and would appear wherever I was at the church. If I went to the parking lot, he was there. If I went to the bathroom, he was there. If I went inside the church through the back door, he was there. I never thought he was stalkerish, just annoying. For about a year, this guy followed me around, and he would leave gifts on the hood of my car, gifts that I would get and throw in the trash immediately. He wasn't that bad, so I never told anyone. I was very innocent and naive. Then, along came a new guy to our church. There was something weird about him, like his eyes were dead. He reminded me of a zombie. I never talked to him, ever, but he took an interest in me. He started sending me gifts with the children from church, taking my Bible and putting love letters inside, and then have a child return it leaving letters on top of my car. Again, I just brushed it off. The real problem began when both stalkers realized they both loved and stalked the same girl, so they became friends. My best friend, brother of the first stalker, would tell me that the newer stalker would go over to their house, where both stalkers would watch the church's YouTube channel and look for bits of clips where I would come out. Then they would edit all the little clips and make a video of just me and add photos they had of me and then proceed to watch their homemade video for hours. They would talk about how God had sent me for them and that I was supposed to be their wife. Again, it wasn't that bad, just very, very creepy. I guess being a giant creep wasn't enough for the new stalker because he began making up stories about me and telling the first stalker he would say that we were actually dating, and that he had met my parents, and that he was always at my house. 
the first stalker would believe him and get very upset. One day, the newer stalker called the first stalker and said he was going to go to my house and if I didn't come outside to talk to him, he would commit suicide. He was saying all sorts of crazy things and he was crying so the first stalker got very scared. They were friends after all and told his mom about it and they proceeded to make guard outside my house for hours in the middle of the night. This happened on more than five occasions. My best friend didn't tell me all of this until later because he didn't want to scare me. Obviously, the new stalker never went to my house, but I guess this made the first stalker up his game. He was in charge of driving the church van whenever the youth groups had outings. On our way back from one of the outings, he realized that I was sitting in the very back of the van with a male friend. He stopped the van in the middle of the road and told me that I wasn't allowed to sit with any males, so I needed to move to the front of the van, next to him. Of course I said no. He said he wouldn't take me home until I moved. I told him I wasn't moving and that he needed to take me home or I would call my parents. He said no and then started begging me to please sit with him. I got off the van and waited for my mom to come pick me up. The other people in the van did nothing to help me out. My parents had a long talk with him and threatened to press charges if he ever got close to me, so he stopped, just like that. The newer stalker saw an opportunity and he took it. On most mornings, I would wake up to broken eggs on my car, and neighbors told my parents that a random car would park in front of my house late at night and then randomly leave. I would get about 20 calls a day from unknown numbers. I started being paranoid. I was scared of coming out of my house because I thought he could be watching me. I hated going to church because all he did was stare at me with his zombie-like eyes. I stopped going out at night because I knew he was around. He started making fake profiles on Facebook and sending me friend requests. I knew it was him. One day he stopped going to church. He just kind of disappeared and he stopped stalking me just like that. I guess he found another person to stalk. It took a long while for me to understand that he had stopped, to not be looking over my shoulder to see if he was around. It was a relief to not see broken eggs on my car every morning, to not feel his gaze fixated on me at church. It has been about eight years since I last saw them, and I finally feel more at peace. Every now and then, though, I'll get a random Facebook request from a profile, and I know that it's him. I'm a young girl in my late teens, and I grew up in a pretty small city, which gets even smaller when the Queens students leave for the summer. Ontario is home to Queens University, which means that I'm not typically alone at night when I go out on my late night endeavors. However, once those students are gone for the summer, I tend to find myself in riskier situations with rougher looking people. It's almost as if when the students leave, the crazies come back. I'm a huge advocate of exploration, and I explore every single chance I can get. This hobby of mine has gotten me into trouble more than a few times, and I'm honestly lucky to still remain unscathed by any insane person to this day. There are quite a few abandoned buildings in my city, which nearly anyone who is interested in horror and adventure would love to find their way inside of. I have an eye for detail, and I am only around 5'1 and 116 pounds, so that makes me the perfect candidate to escape into the small crevices and holes of abandoned buildings. Not too long ago, I had found a building I was scoping out for a while. I found my way in with little effort and understood the dangers of going alone. I am a risk taker, but I'm not stupid. So of course I had someone with me. Now let's just say I wasn't expecting this person to be as flaky and easily frightened as they were. So most of the rooms I entered, I had to enter on my own. Equipped with a flashlight and a bag, in case I found anything super interesting. I explored the dark corners of this building. 
that I didn't expect to be so huge. I found a journal with writing in it that looked to be like a foreign language. And even with my knowledge of different languages, I couldn't decipher what this person was going on about. I also saw multiple mathematical formulas, but with a type of math that I hadn't seen before, surrounded by odd symbols and drawings. There was also a ton of zodiac signs, and talking of the planets and their rotation, which was enough to put me off in itself due to the fact that my own zodiac sign was heavily underlined and rewritten multiple times. Of course I didn't piece anything together here, because it's extremely unlikely anyone would be in the building with me. But I started to feel even more on edge as the night crawled on. I make it a promise to myself to check every room, because I didn't crawl into a dark hole for nothing. My friend had opted in staying near the entrance, and I obliged simply because arguing would lead to noise, and noise led to alerting others of my presence. I continued looking amongst this dark, eerie building, which contained this thick air that I almost felt like I had to sift through, as if it was a thick, visible fog. I had already seen a bed, clothing, books, stickers, anything you can think of but abandoned buildings commonly house these items, as I'm not unfamiliar with squatters staying places for a few days, then moving on. However, in all of my years of exploration, I never encountered someone who stayed in a building or approached me in a building that I entered. I started to get deeper into the building. I went down the stairs and walked down a dark, wet hallway. I felt like I had been here for hours, that there couldn't be anything else that I hadn't explored already. As I got further away from not only my friend, but the exit as well, my basic senses started to heighten. I thought it may have been due to this that I started to smell a disgusting odor near me, one that I hadn't noticed upon initially entering. I was stuck in a hallway with little places to go, so I entered another room, hoping to escape the smell. However, the smell started to turn into footsteps, and I realized the room I was now standing in was barricaded in some way with mattresses against the walls piled on top of one another, needles around my feet, and children's toys scattered carelessly. No red flags go off in my head when I'm in an abandoned building until I stumble upon children's clothing or children's toys. That's where I always draw the line. I turned around and told myself it was time to leave, but I didn't feel like it was just me that was going to be leaving. I started walking back the way I came, finding my way through the mess and the clutter, the disgusting odors and tapping of feet and plunking of water. I hated it there. I hated the buildings I explored that only had one exit. I knew if I made one wrong move it could lead to something awful so I didn't turn around. At this point, either due to adrenaline or my senses heightening, which I believe to have been connected to my adrenaline kicking in, I could literally feel somebody behind me. I heard, I smelled, and felt the presence of somebody walking no more than six feet behind me. At this point, I picked up my pace, but in a way that wouldn't be too obvious. And when I reached the exit, I cannot explain the euphoria I felt. It was such a relief to see my friend and tell her to get the heck out of here. As soon as I started making my way to the hole to exit, I felt a strong grip on my right leg, and my heart literally stopped. Whoever was in this building had clearly been following me and watching me the entire time, but didn't bother touching me until the second I tried to leave. I didn't even look back. I just started kicking my leg and screaming. At this point, I didn't care about people hearing me. My friend quickly caught on and started screaming too, then reached for both of my hands. Whoever had been gripping my leg had gripped me so hard, when I finally broke loose, there were red indents on my calf. We went home and literally didn't speak another word about it. Actually, I tried changing the subject in my shivery voice because I was so scared whoever this person was would have been following us home too. Long story short, 
we weren't followed anymore, and my friend proposed that it may have been somebody else exploring, or a teenager up to no good that wanted to scare me by following me and grabbing me so I would assume I was in danger. Personally, I don't believe that. No normal person smells that horrible, or has that much time to follow around a girl through an abandoned building that, to my initial inspection, had been abandoned for nearly three years. I assumed it was safe since there was no sign of anyone for so long. The next morning there were purple bruises on my leg. I didn't go to the police, because it's not a great impression to be entering abandoned buildings in the first place. I don't know what to make of this experience, but I am so happy I'm alive, and whoever that was didn't grab me sooner. Always, always bring somebody with you when you explore buildings. If it wasn't for my friend grabbing me, I don't know if I would have been able to kick my way out of there. This story that I'm going to share makes my skin crawl and my whole insides cringe just thinking about it. I grew up in a small town in New Zealand and had recently moved to a big city for a university. The town I grew up in was really rough and a gang-oriented place, so I was always somewhat weary of strangers. However, not little old white men in mobility scooters. Living in a big city was awesome because I got to go shopping in malls and Kmart. Kmart in New Zealand is probably the equivalent of Walmart in the U.S., but us Kiwis seem to love it a lot. One day I was shopping at Kmart, looking at the dog beds, which were at the back aisle of the store. Kmart is huge, and the back aisle is the entire length of the store. I get this feeling I am being watched, and I see an old man in a mobility scooter at the opposite end, staring at me. I gave him a smile and turned back to browsing, when in my peripheral I see him racing towards me in his scooter at a great speed. I immediately assumed that his urgency must mean he needs some help reaching or finding something, so I turned to face him. He was a harmless old man, right? Wrong. He quickly starts chatting to me and sharing personal things with me without actually greeting me. He starts telling me how I look like his wife who had passed when she was younger. Then he starts telling me how lonely he is. So I start to feel so much pity for him. And then the conversation starts taking a weird turn. He starts to tell me how he likes to dress up and feel sexy in women's clothing. Then he starts to open his mouth and show me his missing teeth and his gums. The sudden turn of conversation startles me and I start to realize that I need to end this and leave him immediately. After several attempts at saying goodbye, he finally agrees to let me go and holds out his hand for a goodbye handshake. Desperate to leave, I agree to shake his hand in order to leave him alone. Suddenly his grip tightens, and I can't pull my hand away. He forces my hand towards his mouth and begins to make out with the back of it, while swishing his tongue across it in circles. I aggressively pull my hand back and sprint out of the store in shock. The air from running makes the back of my hand feel cold and slimy. So I run to the mall toilets and scrub my hand for a solid 10 minutes, vowing to never let him talk to me again. So I thought I'd never see him again until just recently I did. I was on the bus to you and I, when he gets on without his mobility scooter and a walking stick instead. Thankfully, I had someone already sitting next to me, so I felt safe. However, his eyes scanned the bus, and when they met mine, he immediately smiled. So when the bus got to the interchange, where everybody gets off and gets on, I quickly rushed off the bus so I wouldn't have to see him. I felt my stomach hit the floor when I hear him calling after me. I glance over my shoulder to see him waving his walking stick, yelling and cursing after me. I quickly rush out into the shopping store to lose him, which is a success. The rest of the day goes fine until I go to return home, 
and see that he is waiting at the stop that I board my bus at. I hide until I can see my bus coming. He is looking around and starts to wander away from the bus stop, which is my cue to board quickly. I jump in line and quickly board. However, he has spotted me and is waving his stick and yelling after me. I start to panic as I don't want to be trapped on a bus with him. He's just about to step on the bus when the driver all of a sudden slams the door on him. This makes him furious and he starts smashing his stick against the window and shouting. I look at the driver who smiles and me gives him a nod and starts to pull away onto the road. I am overjoyed that this kind driver has literally just saved me from this creepy old man. So I step up to the window he's hitting and stare directly at him with the filthiest look I can give him while the bus slowly drives away. I literally felt like I got my power back. I later found out that this old man is a well-known creep in the community, which makes me so grateful that the bus driver saved me that day. Just a little disclaimer before I begin this story. I know that the decisions we made were not all the brightest. In fact, they were utterly idiotic, and we should have known better. In fact, we did know better, but we were in a summer party mode and decided to throw all caution to the wind. That was probably the worst mistake we ever made. About a week ago, my friend Sadie and I were hanging out running around the area that we live in. After a long day of walking in the sun, smoking weed, and having a good time, we decided to head to her mom's house, which is in a major city about 20 minutes away from where I lived, and Sadie's grandma that she was staying with lived. Neither of us have cars, so we were forced to use public transit to make the commute to her mom's house. Now, we were not at all new to riding the Trimit, so we knew our way around the system very well. In order to get to her mom's, we needed to take a bus to the local mall, where we could catch a train into the city. Mind you, it was around 11 p.m. at this point, and we were worried that buses would stop running before we got home, so we resolved to call her mom at the train station and ask her to pick us up. We got on our first bus to head to the mall, and quickly noticed that a friend of ours was sitting in the back, talking to some friends. So we went and sat by him to talk for a while. After a few stops, a guy got on and instantly came to the back of the bus where we were. I'm assuming because we all looked about his age. We began talking to him, primarily about drugs, and one by one, the rest of the people in the back got off, leaving me and Sadie with this guy. He eventually proposed that we come with him to his friend's house to hang out and smoke some weed. He said that his house was only a short walk from the mall and that we could come and hang out for a little bit before we headed back to the station to get picked up. For some godforsaken reason, we agreed and got off with him at the mall. The walk to his friend's house was fine for the most part. The guy, whose name was Kyle, was really nice and funny. Just seemed like a kid that wanted to hang out with some girls. The only thing I found concerning was the fact that he had said it was a short walk, but it took us about 20 minutes to get to his friend's house from the mall. I didn't think much of it, though. I figured that just wasn't long for him. Eventually, we reached his friend's house, whose name was Tyler and Kyle went to his window and knocked on it to get Tyler's attention, but Tyler wasn't home. Eventually, Tyler showed up, and we walked over to the swimming pool that was in his apartment complex to hang out there for some reason. The pool was closed at 10, and no one has swimming clothes, so we really just went there to sit on the couch that was there. It was pretty weird, but I was like, oh well, they're just edgy and like to hang out in places they're not supposed to. We pretty much just sat there and talked until the security guard came and told us to leave. From what we could tell at this point, Tyler seemed cool 
like Kyle. He was funny and seemed like a generally laid back kind of guy, so we were having fun. After the security guard at his apartment told us to leave, we actually ended up walking to the apartments across the street and going to their pool. I was nervous at first. I'm not one that particularly enjoys being caught trespassing, especially when I'm under 21 and have weed on me. But Kyle and Tyler assured us that everything was fine and that they hung out there all the time so we didn't need to worry. We sat in chairs by the hot tub and decided to smoke some weed. His weed was weird looking, but it didn't look like spice, so I figured it was just some outdoor homegrown stuff. We were all having a good time getting high, but then all of a sudden Tyler says, I'm gonna kill you guys, which seems harmless if he was just reacting to something that someone said, but no one was even talking to him. Sadie and Kyle were having a conversation and I was looking for music to play. Being a very paranoid person, I was instantly put on edge. I looked over at Sadie to gauge her reaction, but she hadn't heard him and was continuing her conversation with Kyle, who I'm assuming hadn't heard him either. It was weird and it freaked me out, but I figured it wasn't a big deal and I brushed it off. I ended up talking to Tyler about what music he listened to, because I commented on the corn shirt he was wearing, saying that I also liked that band. Every single band he told me made horror, murder, rap, or rock, which I like too, but he seemed really into the lyrics, which made me even more freaked out by the comment he made earlier, but again I brushed it off. Eventually we decided to head back to his apartment and hang out there, but he warned us that we would need to be quiet because he lived with his parents and they were sleeping. When we got there, we had to sneak in, but earlier he had made it seem like it was okay for us to be there. We just had to be quiet, so the situation was immediately uncomfortable. Sneaking into someone's house is just a little too edgy teen for my taste. But regardless, we snuck in and into his room, where we all sat on a bed in a suffocatingly awkward silence for like 10 minutes. The only noise being laughs escaping Sadie and I every few minutes when we would look over at each other and communicate how awkward the situation was with our eyes. Every time we would laugh though, no matter how quiet we were, Tyler would angrily shush us. Eventually to break the silence I asked if they wanted to smoke more weed and they said yeah. So we started smoking the stuff I had brought and I started to get stoned, like I mean blazed and that's why I'm so confused about what happened next. I asked Tyler if we could listen to some music, and lo and behold, he started playing some insane clown posse. That's when he started getting really weird. I was the only one listening, because Kyle had passed out at this point. It was nearly 3 a.m., and we were all really stoned, and Sadie wasn't paying attention. Tyler started saying, I'm gonna get one of you, and pointed at us all, one by one, with a finger gun while laughing. At one point he literally said, I'm going to shoot one of you tonight. At this point I was really on edge. My adrenaline was pumping and I knew I had to get us out of there. I kept waiting until he wasn't looking and nudging Sadie to get her attention and mouthing, he's weird, to her. At first she looked confused, but eventually she caught on and began shooting alarmed looks my way. Shortly after she realized what I was talking about, Tyler stood up and put a stool ladder thing under his doorknob so it wouldn't open from the outside and started reaching into his closet while laughing. I immediately went into survival mode and grabbed the knife I had in my pocket and I opened it, keeping it concealed. It was like everything was moving in slow motion and his hand came out of the closet holding a Nerf gun. I almost started laughing, I was so relieved, but then he proceeded to point it at all of us, then turns the lights off and leaves the room. My first thought was that although the gun was fake, he could be going to go get the real thing right now. I immediately told Sadie that we needed to leave now. This was difficult though because she was lightheaded and thought that if she stood up she would pass out and we were both really high. 
I was just standing there saying we need to go now over and over until she stood up and we rushed out of his room. We ran into him in the hallway and I immediately gave him some excuse that I had an emergency and needed to leave. We rushed out and got far away from that place as fast as we could. This quickly turned into one of the worst nights of my life as we were two severely intoxicated girls walking down unfamiliar roads at three in the morning with no protection but one knife and what little strength we had. We were both incredibly dehydrated and hyped up on adrenaline and this was not mixing well with our highs. We eventually ended up outside of a hospital that was on a busy street across from a hotel with a gas station shortly down the road so there were a good amount of people around and cars driving past us often. We decided that this would be our safe place and that we would wait here until the train started running so we could walk to the station at the mall and get to her mom's house. Things were just really bad. We were both nearly passing out on the sidewalk from exhaustion and dehydration. I started throwing up in the bushes and fighting panic attacks every two minutes and we were very vulnerable. We eventually walked to the gas station and asked the guy if we could get a cup of water because we had no money. He was very kind and allowed us to. I'm going to cut this story short because I know the rest of this doesn't have much to do with the actual encounter with Tyler. But long story short, we eventually made it to her mom's house. We were finally safe and I don't know if I've ever felt so relieved and comforted in my life. I love my mom. I love sharing stories with my mom. I love visiting her and reminiscing about the past. But yesterday we were talking about stories that have happened to us, and we ended up bringing one that I forgot about. This one I'm about to tell you is something that we still wonder about. In the summer of 95, I was 11, sleeping late home alone around 10 to 11 a.m. while my parents were at work. I got woken up by the doorbell, so instinctively, I hurried up down the corridor. But before I rushed to open the door, as I normally would, I remembered the many times my mom scolded me for opening the door without asking first, who is it, or looking through the spy hole to make sure it was safe to open, especially after some previous creepy experiences have already taken place at this point. I asked, who is it? But all I heard was some unintelligible mumble. So I brought a chair and stepped onto it to look through the peephole. We lived in an apartment building, and on the right of our door was the elevator and then the staircase. Since the staircase windows were on the far left corner, there was not enough natural light to help me see who it was. I just saw a man with some colorful t-shirt standing outside. I repeated the question and then strained to hear the answer. He said he was looking for my mother's maiden surname, and I said she was at work. To give you some context, both of my parents are doctors, and I don't know if that sounds weird for the U.S. or the rest of the Western world, but in Eastern Europe in the 90s, it wasn't uncommon for grateful patients to sometimes stop by wanting to give thanks by bringing fresh fruit or vegetables, even produce from their gardens. Especially those with my parents have helped, but they couldn't pay. So the man said he was bringing something for my mom. Except even in the murky light, I could see that his hands were empty. I asked, where is it? And he said he left the package at the stairs. At this point, I'm starting to get this uneasy feeling that something's not right. So I decided to be cautious and lie to him that I don't have keys. I said my parents are at work and they have told me not to open the door to strangers, so when they come back, they can help him. He started to get agitated and said he can't wait this long, and then says that he is actually bringing meat, so it would get spoiled in the heat if it is left outside. I start to hesitate because I'm thinking, what if he's telling the truth? Will I get in trouble for letting the meat spoil? But then I look through the spy hole again and see his hair which means he has his ear pressed at the door, listening in. 
That spooked me and I said, Sorry, I can't help you. Please go away and come back later when I'm not alone. He once again says that he doesn't have time to go back and forth. So he offers to leave and says he will leave the package at the stairs. So when he's gone, I will not be afraid to open the door and retrieve it myself. I keep quiet and intently observe him as he goes down the stairs and makes noise of climbing down. And then I freeze, because in the silence that ensued, I was just about to really open the door and check when I saw part of his shirt sleeve behind the corner of the stairs. He was hiding there, probably hoping I would open the door, thinking he was gone, when in fact he was preparing to, what, pounce on me, break into the apartment? I got so scared I froze and just kept on watching, standing on the chair behind the door. And finally, after what seemed like hours, but was probably maybe ten minutes, I heard him actually descending down the stairs. I didn't open the door. I called my mom's hospital, but she couldn't be put through. So I waited for them to come back home in the afternoon. They both got worried, but proud this time that I finally did the right thing. A few hours later, all the kids from the building and I are at the little square playground bench area in front of it. It was buzzing with kids running around and grandparents and such. So it was completely safe. My best friend Nina and I were sitting on one of the benches when suddenly a strange man approaches us and stands next to the bench. He asks, Are you? And then he says my name. And I hesitantly confirm, although my heart starts to beat faster as I recognize the voice. It's the same man from the morning. This time, I'm not alone, so I instinctively press myself closer to Nina when he says, Well, I'm bringing something for your dad, but it's in the car and I have it parked there on the street. Come with me to help me bring it in. Encouraged by my friend's presence and all the people around, I say to him that actually my dad is home, so if he waits there I will go get him, and he could help him bring whatever he has from the car, as I am little and I cannot carry heavy things. The moment I said it, the guy got very quiet, and then quickly started walking away. Not running, just very quickly walking. My friend who already knew what happened this morning, and I ran to my apartment. I told my dad. He ran in his shorts to chase after the guy, but of course there was no trace left of him. My dad started asking away then, as once again, something typical for Eastern European countries, the grandma sitting on the balconies and benches looking at everyone and everything that's going on, like a life security system. Nobody has noticed anything, except one grandma, an old lady living at the first floor, who says that a guy approached her earlier while she was sitting on her balcony and started asking her about our family, then tried to ask her for money to pay for the meat he was bringing, as he told her that my parents had purchased it from him. She told him that she has no money, but stupidly gave him a lot of information, like my name. We never heard anything about that guy, thank God, but those questions still puzzle me. What did he want? Why did he first say my mom's name, but then said he was bringing something for my dad? Was he actually focused on me? Would he have abducted me? Whatever the answer is, I don't ever want to know.